Today, I'd like to tell you about progress over the last few years on Starshot, thinking about uh, going from the basic questions of the science of the viability of uh, uh, interstellar travel uh, using uh, laser-driven spa uh, light sail spacecraft to considering the spacecraft and the missions. And this is a uh, project that has been in collaboration with some uh, senior investigators, Wes Green, Mike Kelsenberg, uh, Kevin Parkin, and Phil Moskoff. And uh, the stage, stage was set yesterday for this discussion and the, the questions that preoccupy all of us. And the, the questions are, is life common or rare? And we heard that there's uh, of order up one planet per star. And in our stellar neighborhood, we have uh, a wealth of possible opportunities, many stars with, uh, less than ten, within less than 10 light years, uh, and uh, a nearest star that uh, has potential for uh, planet inhabitable zone. So the question is, can we reach them in our lifetime? And so this question um, is, uh, uh, daunting, it is uh, sort of uh, in the context of the fact that the current way that we explore space is not scalable to interstellar dimensions. And if we think about the uh, entire history of uh, space technology and exploration, uh, the number of probes that have gone uh, to various destinations uh, uh, from our, our nearest neighbors in, within our solar system to the outer planets uh, decreases to the point, uh, and if we consider the number that have uh, gone uh, 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 fully beyond the uh, uh, heliopause, only five probes have ever left uh, the solar system. And that's because of this daunting uh, gap, this yawning gap here. Well, if we have spacecraft that are propelled by chemical propellants, uh, traveling at kilometers per second, uh, the speed uh, and the, uh, there's just a mismatch in the speed and the distances involved uh, for interstellar travel. And yet, what are the opportunities? If we could get close uh, we, uh, to uh, an exoplanet and uh, look for technosignatures or look for evidence of life and uh, uh, other things that other scientific uh, uh, um, uh, uh, other scientific benefits and knowledge that might uh, accrue by a closer look, we can get a, a, vi a vision of what might be possible by looking at what was seen by New Horizons, uh, uh, by uh, getting up close within uh, less than a million kilometers uh, in 2015, uh, as compared with uh, the view from the Hubble Space Telescope uh, 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 nearby the Earth. And we can think about this also in, con in, in the context of what would it, uh, imagine we had a starshot light sail spacecraft approaching the Earth uh, at 20% of the light speed. And one can uh, think about what would be the, what, what you would see at a distance uh, a week away at 20% of the light speed. And the uh, image that one would see with a, a conventional image sensor would be uh, less than a pixel in size. But as we get close, uh, within say two hours of the distance of closest approach, this is what we would see at about uh, a little less than three AU away. Uh, and as we get to within an hour, uh, this is what we would see. We would see something uh, with where we'd see, uh, now collect of the order of a few hundred pixels, perhaps. Uh, and then, as we get at a distance of closest approach, say five minutes uh, away at 20% of the light speed, uh, at a tenth of an AU, not, uh, uh, so there's a decimal point missing there, but uh, now we're able to collect something uh, on the order of thousands of pixels, a 16 kilobit image. And this is now uh, at the resolution where we would be able to resolve features, uh, technosignatures, uh, features of atmospheres and so forth explicitly in an image. So if we think about the entire uh, arc of human progress uh, in, and parameterized in terms of the, um, uh, our uh, venturing uh, out into the, uh, 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 on, on further and more, uh, more distant journeys, we can think about this in terms of a uh, progression in terms of power per unit weight uh, from uh, horse and carriage to horseless carriage to air travel to rocket travel and going beyond chemical rockets to 
uh, propulsion by ion engines. Uh, we can, there's an ever increasing uh, power per unit weight now in the range of kilowatts per kilogram in terms of power per unit weight. And as a sort of strategy, we can think about this as being uh, pro progressing from a strategy where the power and the propellant uh, for a vehicle are both on board the vehicle, uh, both the cars that we drove up here today in and the airplanes that we flew on uh, contain the, the fuel and the engine. Uh, in the case of something like the Dawn spacecraft, uh, using solar electric propulsion, the power is provided by the sun, uh, 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 but the propellant is on board, the, the uh, 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 mass uh, for the ion engine. Uh, and the next logical progression is to go to the point where the power and the propellant are both external to enable higher power per unit mass. And of course, this is all uh, constrained by the sobering calculus of the rocket equation. Uh, and you can see, uh, if we think about, uh, we're to sort of notionally use the rocket equation to look at the uh, fuel mass required to get to 10% of the light speed. Uh, this is just a, a, a completely daunting question. So that's why we turn to light itself uh, as the medium. Light is the fuel, uh, and using radiation pressure and the momentum transfer photons, the momentums uh, carry very little uh, mass and very little momentum, but have uh, enormous speed. And this is not a new idea. Uh, we can trace back to the history, if we look, go back to the earliest invention of the maser and the laser, at the, right around the time that Charles Townes uh, developed the maser, nearly contemporaneously Ted Maiman at the Hughes Research Lab in Malibu, California, in 1960 developed the ruby laser. Uh, and Maiman's colleague uh, at Hughes Research Lab, Bob Forward, almost immediately grasped the opportunity uh, of using lasers to imagine a kilometer scale aperture here. He imagined a zone plate uh, type structure using an optical source, a terawatt scale laser. He was thinking very ambitiously from the laser of Ted Maiman um, to focus on a light sail. Uh, so already, uh, even uh, just after the uh, uh, earliest uh, imagination of the laser, this idea was already present in the ether. Uh, and further progress was uh, made in thinking about, uh, considering all the aspects about how close to the speed of light one could uh, actually approach um, using a terrestrially uh, uh, located laser beam uh, in 1966. Another big advance was made by Phil Lubin, who really wrote down it for the first time in a comprehensive fashion, uh, kind of an encyclopedic uh, uh, assembly of all the information one would need and a very, uh, um, uh, very clearly laid out but quite detailed uh, analysis of the governing equations, um, some of the concepts, in fact, including most helpfully a number of nomograms from which you can read off exactly how fast you can go for a given uh, mass, uh, uh, sail area, uh, and uh, laser intensity. Uh, and Phil also imagined uh, how one would put together the phased array systems, the photon engines that would enable this to make it possible. And this uh, really set the stage for uh, uh, th th thinking about uh, th the approaches uh, that could be possible with Starshot. So if we think about the governing equation here, velocity proportional to the uh, uh, laser power uh, times the uh, sail or array size divided by wavelength to the one half time and mass to the one quarter. So we, one can imagine pointing uh, a laser pointer like the one I'm pointing at the screen now at an object uh, that weighs about a gram like a thumbtack. Uh, and if this is sitting, we're on, sitting on a frictionless surface, we could within a week, if I had a very uh, long-lived battery, we could anticipate that in the absence of other forces to, that we would be able to impart a velocity of a millimeter per second. So that illustrates that, uh, the, that's an illustration of the uh, fact that photons carry very little momentum, so we need to go to very high power densities uh, of order a megawatt per centimeter squared. So to go to 20% of the light speed and to accelerate a uh, mass of a gram uh, in 10 minutes, 
We need a sail area of some 16 square meters, uh, uh, which uh, over this uh, impulse, over 10 minutes, uh, will uh, enable us to resolve still with the laser source a uh, diffraction limited beat laser spot onto the sail, uh, fully filling and not overfilling the sail, which requires now an aperture size of the order of a kilometer in size. And so that's depicted here. And that analysis uh, really built the excitement that culminated in the announcement uh, made by Yuri Milner, along with this uh, venerable cast of characters, uh, in 2016, uh, announcing at the World Trade Center the uh, beginning of the Breakthrough Starshot program. And uh, uh, at the moment, uh, the, uh, some of these people were reported to have said, uh, Stephen Hawking, I believe this is what makes us unique in transcending our limits. Yuri Milner, if this mission comes to fruition, it will tell us as much about ourselves as about Alpha Centauri. Mae Jameson, we started space exploration, uh, author of the 100-year starship, uh, a thousand years ago when we started to track the stars. And our own Pete Worden concluded, I've just got to conclude by saying this is really cool from these hard challenges onto the stars. So thank you, Pete, for giving us our admonition. And the excitement built later the same year uh, with the discovery of a terrestrial planet candidate in a, a temperate orbit, temperate meaning uh, such that uh, one can imagine uh, temp uh, temperatures that would uh, be in the uh, uh, room temperature uh, uh, regime around a Proxima b, a red dwarf, uh, which of course at that temperature means that the orbit now uh, is uh, only 5% of the Earth-Sun distance. Uh, but really the first example of a, a, a planet uh, a candidate in our, true, in our true neighborhood. So that launched a research program beginning in 2017 and 2018, whose goal was to identify the science issues that would either enable or prevent a spacecraft, a photon engine, and the communication systems need to bring the data back to the Earth. Uh, could these be done? Uh, and so the goals were to develop scientific principles, to define design concepts, and really to build a community, a worldwide community for advancement of laser-driven light sail science and technology. And so this is a large community. So this is a community of uh, the research team across the photon engine, the light sail, communications, power, all of the things that have gone into consideration of the viability that would either prevent or enable uh, this possibility. Beginning with the light sail, some of the things that were learned over the last uh, five years or so are what were some of the candidate materials? So uh, like the British monarchy, we needed an heir and a spare. We needed a, a, a leading candidate and some alternatives. Uh, so we identified uh, that silicon nitride, a material available in thin film form used widely in uh, thin film and electronics, uh, uh, fabrication uh, is an optomechanics, has extremely high strength and low absorption. Uh, and there are uh, al favorable alternative materials coming from, for example, the van der Waals and two-dimensional materials that have evolved rapidly in the material science community. We developed optical designs for stable, efficient propulsion uh, that enable both shape stability and beam riding and developed simulation tools for understanding of the sail dynamics. In the area of light sail materials, it recognized that the leading candidates could be vetted in terms of their absorption coefficient, the mass density, and ultimately the refractive index, which determines uh, what is the suitability as a reflector uh, and for otherwise sculpting uh, the dispersion of light. Uh, and the candidates are largely brittle ceramic materials Diamond, silicon nitride, silicon, semiconductors like gallium arsenide, uh, materials, two-dimensional materials like molybdenum diselenide. Uh, so we also developed tools, multi-physics simulations, combining uh, finite element models for thermal 
uh, optical, uh, structural, and mechanical shapes that assess the stability. And we found that flat light sails are unstable with respect to shape. Uh, if you spin stabilize a flat light sail, that can stabilize the shape, but ultimately it's not a beam riding uh, uh, configuration. So beam riding means we want to, on a focused uh, Gaussian beam, we want to be able to have the beam, uh, the spacecraft follow this, uh, the optical axis. So you might think that making a parabola, which seems to be a stable shape, would be possible, but we need to be able to spin this parabola in order to shape stabilize it. You can see spinning does help, uh, ultimately, spinning at this speed uh, allows the shape to be stable for a while, but ultimately goes uh, unstable. But spinning uh, at an appropriate speed allows uh, beam riding, stable, uh, uh, shape stable the development. That's great, but parabolas are challenging to make if we're going to make a, a gram scale structure that's a, a few hundred nanometers thick, uh, that's uh, uh, meters in size. So uh, what is much easier to make flat structures. That's how we make uh, 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 structures uh, in thin film form nowadays, uh, fl flat on wafers. So by making metagrading structures that scatter light, creating restoring forces and torques, flat light sails, like the one shown right here, can be stabilized to be beam riding and also shape stable. Uh, so that was a major advance. So we can work with a flat sail and allow that sail by encoding metagrading structures on its surface, uh, encode scattering angular dispersion that gives rise to shape structures um, uh, interacting with the uh, uh, photon engine beam that sh shape stabilize very, in a way very similar to that of a parabola. We can create a phase gradient across that light sail that looks very much like specular reflection from a parabola. And we began to make first laboratory prototypes, tiny optomechanical micro light sails that can allow us to test the radiation pressure forces in ultra high vacuum. Uh, and we were able to measure those radiation forces, uh, pressure forces, uh, and to see the force, the temperature, the displacement, and the mechanical dynamics of such structures. So we can think about uh, advances in the photon engine. And some of the things that we learned is that uh, to build uh, a viable system for laser-driven light sail travel to the stars, we need to build photon engines because of the very small momentum transfer uh, at very large power and power density uh, and at large aperture size, scalable to kilometer size arrays. Uh, so the number of elements required is daunting. Uh, it's uh, billions uh, of elements at the centimeter scale, and we need to be able to have these uh, made in a mass production fashion. Uh, uh, so uh, for the, the, the nominal 20% uh, of the light speed point design, that corresponds to an array size of the order of 2.8 kilometers uh, with a total power uh, during the impulse of 200 gigawatts. Another lesson learned was the need uh, for an orbiting beacon, very similar to the situation for adaptive optics uh, uh, in telescopes located on this, uh, the Earth. If we have a photon engine, which is also now uh, pumping uh, and propelling a light sail in orbit from the surface of the Earth, we need to be able to compensate for the refractive index instabilities in the Earth's atmosphere just like you do in imaging uh, starlight coming to a terrestrial telescope. Uh, and so the conditions for making an orbital beacon were, were outlined. Uh, and uh, this is an orbital beacon uh, that has a, about a four-day orbit. Uh, and it has to be able to track the sky, uh, night sky, to an arc second. Uh, and the orbital beacon, of course, has to be located very close to the <clears throat> direction that the uh, photon engine uh, uh, um, pumps the light sail on its journey to the destination. And building such a large laser system, in addition to building all of the components, one of the really daunting systems challenges is developing the capacity for phase control. Phase control for up to 100 million optical elements. So that means distribution of, uh, because we need to have coherence across the entire phased array. That's a very daunting challenge, and 
talented group at Opti uh, Australian National University, <clears throat> was able to develop uh, a schematic and analytic model uh, for a system that allows distribution of a seed laser uh, through the first uh, sec layers of sectors and modules, finally to the actual emitting apertures to enable uh, large-scale distribution of the optical phase required for the phased array. Because such a large number of semiconductor lasers are required, and because it's really the largest uh, pole in the tent with regard to the cost of building a system, the cost of the lasers was carefully analyzed, both for fiber amplifier lasers, which are probably the nearest term opportunity for building a photon engine uh, uh, with, with components that are available today. Uh, but ultimately, uh, it seems uh, very, uh, um, uh, very uh, interesting to consider the use of semiconductor lasers, uh, which are uh, in our, uh, uh, which I have in my hand now, and which we have in our everyday uh, use, uh, which are both both fiber amplifiers and semiconductor lasers are following different Moore's law curves, uh, and so. Uh, Integrated photonics is going to be necessary in order for this cost curve to be followed with a, about a 10,000 cost uh, X cost reduction. Uh, but we know the history of Moore's law for electronics uh, followed uh, truly this trajectory. In the area of communications, uh, the communications team, uh, which is uh, continuing its work, um, has identified a baseline system for optical communications. Today, of course, we use in spacecraft mainly RF apertures uh, for communications. We're just now beginning to see the first introduction of uh, optical communications. And uh, for example, with the uh, uh, imminent launch of Psyche, uh, and, uh, the, which will be a first uh, test of deep space optical communications. Uh, uh, and for Starshot, optical communications is really the uh, uh, plan of record. But this requires four to six orders of magnitude improvement over where we are today with the designs that are, uh, have been developed for Psyche. Uh, there don't seem to be fundamental barriers to the required data rights to develop the you know, tens of kilobit uh, type images that I showed you uh, earlier, uh, uh, where, where we are tens to 100 kilobit images uh, per probe. But we do need to be able to overcome this gap between current optical comms uh, and what's required for Starshot. And so that six orders of magnitude could be made up in a number of different ways. It could be made up simply by developing a large scale uh, ground station, a receiver station, instead of a single optical telescope, an array of optical telescopes. And that requires uh, developing optical telescopes at very low cost. Uh, other options are including uh, going to uh, slightly higher laser power uh, from 10 milliwatts to 100 milliwatts, uh, or signal processing, which might bring us an order of magnitude through encoding and detection. So uh, one of the things that will be uh, you know, truly uh, uh, decisive for Starshot is the development of a revolutionary technology of optical phased arrays. We're very familiar with phased array RF apertures. Uh, and in, over the last few years, technologists have brought us now the first uh, um, early and emerging technologies for optical phased arrays. Some of these are beginning to appear commercially in systems for LIDAR, uh, laser range finding. Uh, and although phased arrays were invented uh, more than 100 years ago, uh, optical phased arrays are now developing uh, and have the potential to really revolutionize uh, both transmission uh, for the Starshot communication aperture and imaging. If I can develop an optical phased array that can focus, and, and we've developed in my laboratory the ability to uh, electronically steer beams and to electronically focus uh, a, a beam uh, using uh, an electronically reconfigurable phased array, which then leads to the possibility of developing lensless cameras instead of a lens coupled image sensor where the lens acts like a Fourier transform element onto the image sensor, you can do the Fourier transform at the image sensor itself. So this uh, 
has really interesting capabilities. So to make up this uh, large uh, 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 gap in optical communications, uh, signal to noise, uh, between uh, going, uh, receiving an optical signal at a single telescope, uh, the University of Arizona began uh, looking at designs for low-cost telescopes that could be built in a uh, format very much like the heliostat formats that are used in kilometer size arrays for concentrating solar power uh, and developed uh, uh, mechanical feedback and control to control the uh, uh, position of the uh, collected light uh, at the uh, center of uh, the aperture. So now I want to turn to uh, the uh, vision for where we could go. So I've told you a little bit about what's been learned over the last five years. So where could we go as in going thinking from the physics? So we, we've now vetted uh, the light sail, the communications, the photon engine, uh, the needs for power. And there's nothing that defies the laws of physics. There are no physical impossibilities, no showstoppers. But that's different from saying there's, it's possible to build a spacecraft. So what is possible? So I'm going to give you an imagination here of what could be possible in the area of making a spacecraft. So, and what we've been thinking about from all that we've learned is something like this. Something that has, in order to meet the goals of the 20% uh, of the light speed point design uh, interstellar mission, a light sail whose nominal thickness, fabricated in a membrane, a quilted membrane of silicon nitride uh, of 100 nanometers, a light sail that has fully embedded into it a communications aperture of about, uh, so the entire light sail is about four meters in diameter. The communications aperture, about a meter in diameter, that's required um, as the aperture size to focus uh, using electronic beam steering uh, in an optical phased array, a beam spot size that slightly overfills the aperture of the Earth. Compute nodes that do the uh, uh, onboard uh, communication and control and uh, computing data collection. Uh, active optical emitters, uh, light emitting diodes that are used for navigation by radiation pressure. Thin film power sources, thin film versions of radioisotope thermoelectric generators made not in bulk form, but thin film fabrication like we do for integrated circuits. Optical apertures that are also reconfigurable phased arrays that, as I mentioned, allow for imaging without a lens. Thin film magnetometers, power and data buses, all integrated into the surface of the light sail. So I'll say a little bit about each of these structures. Uh, and then in between the instrumentation layer there's a laser reflector layer in order to partition the megawatt per square centimeter power density that the light sail experiences during the acceleration impulse from the instruments. Uh, and then the beam riding metagrading structures that are needed for the sail stabilization as it spins. So as I mentioned, the communications aperture uses optical phase arrays made where active elements adjust the relative phase uh, and from a light source, a laser light source embedded in the light sail, which now uh, acts as a leaky waveguide where each the relative phase of the outcoupled light at each element allows for beam forming, reconfigurable beam forming, using an optoelectronic active material such as lithium niobate. Instrumentation needed for electronics control, uh, low power logic instrumentation uh, for spectrometry, magnetometry, um, are now coming into the mass range that's, uh, that's quite interesting. So we have, uh, for example, semiconductor electronics available in the, uh, from 100 milligrams on down to a milligram in size. So this is a, uh, an entire chipset here. It's a, 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 an earlier version flown by Zach Manchester, entire uh, chipset 
uh, with uh, power controller gyroscope magnetometer here, um, which is uh, only a few grams in size. Uh, and uh, flat imaging optics, like the kinds that I told you about uh, earlier to uh, uh, enable uh, um, uh, uh, manipulation of light uh, without uh, bulky lenses. The reflective layer here um, is a photonic crystal. This photonic crystal is made of uh, silicon nitride and molybdenum disulfide, and that acts as a layer that's highly reflecting and also has a very high emissivity in the infrared, which is required for the thermal management. And that allows, despite this uh, very high power density, uh, the instruments to maintain temperatures uh, within uh, uh, the range of between 300 and 500 Kelvin. Metagratings uh, in silicon nitride that allow for the stabilization of the beam riding structure. Thin film uh, power sources. And uh, the, the many power sources were considered by a group led by Mason Peck to consider uh, the options for power and energy uh, for, the, for the light sail and to uh, what ultimately required to return 100 kilobits of data. Uh, and the group determined that the sail needs to be able to be able to source a total of 14 kilojoules of energy, about 20 microwatts continuously, and then uh, at moments of high scientific activity to be able to deliver up to a watt of peak power. Uh, and the primary technology that seems most compelling or most uh, uh, accessible is a thin film version of a radioisotope thermoelectric generator in such Structures have already been fabricated uh, in the laboratory using uh, uh, where a, a hot radioisotope hot source is located here and a thermal gradient across thermoelectric materials generates the power. So the photon engine. So the photon engine um, is integrated with a uh, uh, power distribution and phase control system that is coupled to an orbiting beacon, as I mentioned earlier. Um, this orbiting beacon sits at about uh, 200,000 kilometers, uh, a large distance from the Earth. Uh, the light sails are dispensed from a mothership, uh, imagine in a sort of cassette form, at 60,000 kilometers. Uh, and this orbiting beacon, of course, uh, which uh, who's in, in terms of its uh, uh, alignment in the sky, is very close to the uh, to the source within a. Uh, an arc second or so of the source um, uh, or, 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 or the, the, the target in the sky. So uh, this allows, it's crucial for the phase control that allows us to form a fully coherent beam at megawatt per square centimeter uh, uh, power densities. The photon engine itself is composed of semiconductor laser components made by ordinary semiconductor microfabrication technology in modules uh, that are, uh, include a, a compact module that ha com comprises an external, what's called a vertical external cavity surface emitting laser, an external laser resonator that builds up power, uh, and a, a hologram and cavity actuators that are used for beam uh, phase control and beam shape control over the exit aperture. So the actual active size of the laser here is only a few hundred microns on the size. Uh, on a side, uh, and uh, the size of each of the elements is about half a centimeter in size. Those elements are arrayed together into tiles of ten, uh, the uh, individual elements into 10 centimeter tiles, They're almost like a terracotta tile roof here. Semiconductor lasers sitting on a panel, a panel that uh, has uh, underneath the array of semiconductor lasers, water cooling, and then uh, battery storage, which is used to imagine using uh, renewable electricity to charge up battery arrays whose uh, discharge capacity is matched to the total power required for the uh, impulse over a 10 or 15 minute time period. Uh, and these ultimately assembled into panels here with uh, 400 tiles per panel, so about 100 kilowatts from each panel. Um, uh, in, uh, in this uh, kind of format, about the size of a solar module. And then ultimately, going from the laser to the tile to the panel 
to the entire array size. So the entire array size consisting of arrays of panels. Um, here more than uh, uh, 1 million panels, 700 million tiles, 300 billion individual elements, so many elements. That sounds like a lot. But think about the number of uh, integrated circuits that each of us has. Uh, so you, can, you account in your life, daily life for more than 1,000 integrated circuits uh, on average as a human on Earth. Uh, so that, uh, now if we take the human population, already corresponds to trillions of integrated circuits. So this is not an unimaginable number uh, for us to think about building. Now, to receive the signal at the surface of the Earth, we need to be able to demonstrate a receiver that's scalable so that the entire receiver aperture size allows us to uh, span this four orders of magnitude signal-to-noise ratio for data. So we need to be able to develop individual telescopes with low mass and cost that are coupled with low-cost spectrometers and single photon detectors that are an emerging technology uh, in electronics, optics, and, for example, quantum information systems. So we imagine a communication receiver consisting of ground receiver aperture elements with a single op optical reflective element uh, coupling light uh, into a, re a receiver with a relay uh, and then uh, into, uh, with adaptive optics, into a fiber uh, system. Uh, so for scale here, a couple of meters in size. Uh, arrayed in a battery of receivers here uh, with 12 receivers in, a, uh, in, a, in an array. Uh, and now laid out. Uh, so here's, for reference, a standard size soccer field, uh, uh, an array. So now, important to keep in mind that the receivers are not a coherent array. The photon engine, of course, has to be a coherent array. The receivers don't need to be, they, they're basically light buckets. They're just receiving photons. So we don't need coherence, uh, so we don't have to be so careful about building a dense array in uh, relative positioning. So now we can imagine taking the soccer fields and building this up, and here is an array of uh, here, uh, 32 by 32 uh, tile arrays, and 50 of these fields is what is required now for the entire receiver to span that four orders of magnitude. So each of these receivers couples light into a fiber bundle, uh, which is brought uh, to um, uh, imagers uh, with dispersing elements that couple light into a single photon detector array. So where, what are the missions that one might be enabled by such a technology? One can imagine that uh, using the uh, um, uh, governing equations that uh, I showed uh, on a set of earlier slides, that we could imagine missions uh, as precursors to the interstellar mission that would allow us to build spacecraft with a cruise velocity of 100 AU per year. So three times that of, say, a solar sail sun diver spacecraft. Uh, so that would allow about a 10 gram payload on a light sail that is five meters in diameter. And in this case, uh, the uh, impulse works out to be a longer, much longer impulse, hours rather than minutes uh, in duration. But the photon engine is only a fraction of the photon engine needed for the interstellar mission, um, uh, half a kilometer in size uh, and with a much smaller <coughs> uh, uh, total size and budget um, uh, totaling uh, uh, a few hundred million dollars uh, uh, based on what we know, know today. And the future going forward, if we think about the uh, opportunities starting at 100 uh, AU per year, which is, uh, allow, would allow us to reach, for example, uh, reach to Mars within two days, reach Nept Neptune in a matter of months, or the heliopause within a year. And then as the uh, exponential decline in laser uh, technology cost allows us to access larger and larger photon engine sizes, <clears throat> we can begin to access um, higher and higher power densities in coherent arrays and use the learning from uh, such an initial precursor mission with a small aperture size 
to allow us to, uh, in the mid-century time scale, reach to the stars to enable the Starshot point design mission that we all imagined back in 2016. So that's a vision of where the light sail spacecraft Starshot mission arc of progress can go. Thank you very much.